This is more of an overview um, of things. So uh, off we go. Um, I have no conflict of interest, but just note that um, I'm clearly a lobbyist for the Centre for Perioperative Care. They pay for one PA of my time. Everything else I do for fun. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of that in this talk. Um, and again, I'm no longer on the Council of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. I was for 10 years, and um, but I'm still um, a practicing orthopedic surgeon. OK. Um, so I was lead author for this report, Exercise, the Miracle Cure and the Role of the Doctor in Promoting It. And that came out in 2015. And that basically collated a lot of stuff saying that if you do exercise at a dose of 150 minutes a week, as in 30 minutes, five times a week, or you cycle to work for 15 minutes, cycle home 15 minutes, five times a week, you're done. <laughs> it reduces your risk of dementia 30%, stroke 30%, that kind of thing. Um, and Actually, now lots of people know that, um, but at the time it hadn't been brought together in that way. Um, now, perioperative care is from the moment of contemplation of surgery until full recovery. So what we're trying to do is whatever we can put in, wherever we can put it to make that pathway better for that individual patient to reduce complications. And CPOC, um, if you haven't heard of it before, please join up, get the newsletter, um, CPOC uh, at rcoa.ac.uk, and do follow um, us on Twitter. Um, and there's lots of very distinguished um, organisations that are partners um, of this. And it's mostly funded by the Royal College of Anesthetists, um, several hundred thousand pounds. Um, so it, it's really, really, really good stuff. So um, do use um, the stuff on there. Um, and one of the things we've done is evidence reviews. Um, we collated, these are on, on the website, um, we collated how perioperative care works, what are the critical picks that work, and basically you can reduce complications 30, 50, even 80 percent with certain interventions. You can reduce bed stays by one to two days, you get better team working, better patient satisfaction. Um, um, so complications, um, I should put that slide up for a moment and leave you all to think about your worst complication or something, but that's probably a horrible place to be. Um, and the bit that I don't talk about so much is failure to rescue. Um, and that's something that's come out of the general surgery um, GERF report, that you actually need um, some clear pathways and clear triggers for when someone should be alerted um, if, if there might be a post-operative problem. Um, and complications, as we know, are general for the for the patient um, and specific and can be early and, and specific to the operation and can be early and can be late. But you need to kind of preempt the fact they might happen and put them into the pathways and, and put them into things you want to be the things to, to be alerted for. Um, we've produced new guidance working with the um, Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine on enhanced perioperative care. And this is the bit between ward care and critical care. So if someone isn't sick enough to need to go to critical care, but they do need a bit more than ward care, that's where they can go. And it, it's, it's, um, it's about little bits of training to upskill the ward nurses to be able to rotate through those areas, that kind of thing. Um, so do look at that if you have any potential um, to, um, to, to, to create that kind of um, area. And this is about money, because obviously we're all lovely clinicians and we want to help people and be nice. Um, but actually, this is what matters. The little grey dots are an individual patient and the area of the triangles and the um, uh, other shapes are um, the amount of money spent. So 3% of patients are responsible for 45% of hospital costs. And those 3% aren't the person... Um, it, it, it's basically it's somebody's granny with a UCI with a complication with a staying in hospital a bit too long um, and that sort of thing that, that those are patients um, that are, are costing um, costing the, the, the um, money so this it's worth improving everybody it's important to improve everybody because it's a nice thing to do but it also is about is about the money 
Um, Fifteen percent of operations will have a complication. They're more common in certain patients if they're frail, physically inactive. It's about four or five times more. And interventions do work to um, reduce the risk of complication, even just for a very short amount of time. And, and a certain proportion of patients express regret. Um, at Fourteen percent is the number from a um, a, a literature review of, of, of that. Um, and bearing in mind, twenty-seven percent of UK adults do no exercise at all, and are, are not um, are not as fit as they could be. Um, there are some things that we could work on to to reduce complications. Um, risks are either fixed or modifiable, and there are risk prediction tools um, to look at people's risks. But we do need to work on things that are modifiable. There are actually seven things that are proven to reduce complications. Um, the big one, smoking, about 50% reduction in complications, 19% per week of reduced smoking in the World Health Organization, if you just Google that. Um, exercise um, work not just by improving heart-lung fitness, but it works on inflammation, there's a metabolic effect, very empowering for patients, improves pain, uh, pain management. Um, so exercise is part of any prehabilitation program, but we don't you don't have to have a prehabilitation program to get started. You can just tell your patient to go for a walk or to climb stairs or to get an, a static exercise bike um, and sit on it and um, sit on it every day for 20 minutes. Um, nutrition is a, is a very big one. Um, and then then there are other things that are part of that should be part of the optimization process. So pre-assessment clinics shouldn't just be about documenting things. It should be about prompting people to improve their health in any of these areas. Um, and some places that have surgery schools, for example, um, have uh, published people halving their alcohol intake before um, their operation, for, for example. Um, Prehabilitation pre is um, th th there are a number of places there's um, around the country that have um, prehabilitation services um, the, in Liverpool, Southampton, um, Kent. Um, some have been uh, funded by Macmillan and they all have coached exercise uh, with some other things around psychological preparation um, nutrition. And the nutrition is, is fruit and vegetables. It's vit vitamin C and protein to get the wound to heal. Um, it's not all about obesity management. Um, so prehabilitation does work. There are some astonishing results uh, with it. Um, and with exercise, it's the cardiovascular bit. So getting going as much as you can, um, but it's also strength and, and a bit of being able to get up out of a chair um, and so forth afterwards um, and get out of bed afterwards. So you can learn to do this. So um, if you go to movingmedicine.ac.uk, so um, please feel free to press print screen, open a Word document, paste in, um, and then you can find all this stuff later and you can keep going uh, print screen anytime you want to save one of these slides and, and stuff. We'll come back watch it later. Movingmedicine.ac.uk um, has some resources for patients and resources for all staff, uh, not just senior clinicians, it's for everybody about how you could talk about exercise in a one minute conversation. Um, and, and fit it into the consultation as just being normal and listen to the patient, ask what they do already, assess where they might fit in more um, and listen to where they might fit in more. Uh, we've talked about fruit and vegetables. I mean, you can get frozen vegetables from Lidl and Aldi um, and, and, there is, and, and there is stuff now about um, low carbs. I think yeah, the uh, Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition um, has just published something about considering low carbohydrate diets because for some people that are particularly inactive um, this actually works better than um, low calorie diets that are predominantly carbohydrates so just bear that in mind and um, uh, for, for nutrition I think this is going to get um, have, have a much bigger impact at some point. And just to say surgical admissions, this is from the um, GERFT um, in anesthesia and perioperative medicine that if you just again look, look, look it up, um, about half our work is in people who are um, over 65 um, and there's not enough day surgery really being done. Um, that's certainly around a quarter um, of the um, cases requiring an anesthetic uh, going to day surgery and, and there's plenty of room for improvement um, there. 
uh, and just to note that at that age, um, people, 50% uh, of the population are multimorbid. They have um, two or more um, uh, comorbidities and it goes up and up with age and with social deprivation. Um, so it's about doing improving patients, even with all their multi comorbidities. And actually exercise works not just for um, preventing primary prevention, but also for um, tertiary prevention, reducing the complications for someone who actually has um, a uh, condition. So at Centre of Preventive Care, we've launched some new guidance on diabetes, on frailty, and, um, and, and the diabetes with the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, frailty was with the uh, British Geriatric Society, and day surgery was with getting it right first time in the British Association of Day Surgery. So you can find all those on our website or indeed on their websites, um, and we've got a video launch that's still available um, for the day surgery delivery pack. Um, and it's basically um, kind of instructions almost of how how to do it it's kind of fairly clear with frailty for example you need to measure it and then work out how that could impact the patient and then try to improve things um and it, it, it's pretty clear at, at each stage but the difficult bit with diabetes and with frailty is that people aren't measuring it and probably because they're not realizing that you can improve things um and, and obviously one of the improvements might be having a shared decision making discussion with the patient about whether they want to go ahead or whether they want to delay things for an improvement so this is just a pitch from the diabetes uh, guideline. Um, so, uh, you know, at the point of referral, you want some information about diabetes before surgery. Um, you want to know the HbA1c. You, you want to use the surgery as a teachable moment to improve things. And I say the big things are exercise and nutrition, um, really, really big. Um, and then multiple other things as you go along to try and make things better. But actually, it's a finite number of things that are improvable. And just to say the dreaming there is drinking, eating and mobilising early um, to try and get people people back back home. But anything you can do in advance, do in, in, in advance so people are ready. And there are recommendations in each of those reports for patients and for carers um, at the point of referral of a pre-assessment staff, ward staff and for organisations. Um, and my uh, patient information, um, this is uh, cpop.org.uk forward slash patients. Please use that. Please send it around to everybody. Give it to your patients, all the staff, um, because it just it kind of encourages people to really take ownership of their operation and get as good as they can be to reduce complications. Um, and patient information is really useful because sometimes what what you think is obvious isn't obvious. And sometimes one gets so stuck in discussing the details that one doesn't get out to the thing that actually really matters to the patient um, about how they're going to be afterwards. So, you know, get any information you can and get it out to patients and get it used. Um, and bearing in mind, different people have different um, reading abilities and get uh, or different access to the internet, get their families involved as well. Uh, this is just about some other staff. Um, I came to talk about doctor's assistants in Nottingham. Uh, when I came, I came to Nottingham to talk about doctor's assistants, we now have 15 in East Sussex, and they basically help doctors to relieve the pressure on doctors. They run around with forms, take requests, um, uh, get the patient list up to date. Um, uh, that's that sort of thing. Uh, put in drips, get the next um, information the next patient for the ward done that kind of thing so um if you want to know about the apprenticeship for that um let me know it's an online apprenticeship um and, and they are fantastic band three um so we, we also did pre-operative assessment and optimization um and uh this this guidance is about using that using the moment um of getting someone ready for an operation to improve them hopefully forever at that teachable moment we can start in the surgical clinic by actually, you know, trying to see how much someone can do. You know, can they sit to stand? How many sit to stands can they do in a minute? Um, how much do they actually do? How fit are they? Could they improve it? Because unless we talk about it, people won't see it as important. And um, patients are just too passive. The NHS, I fear, has done that um, to people. Um, and we need to get geriatricians, physicians or pharmacists involved in the high risk patients um, to sort out the polypharmacy um, and so forth so that people are tipped up um, when they when they get there. Um, so uh, there's the guidance and there's a separate editorial um, which I've put up there with the link um, because this is the one with the flow chart in. So basically what we need is the surgical patient. We need surgeons to assess fitness and to assess risk. 
and most of this could be done with a kind of almost a self-assessment and the nurses um, uh, checking the validity, talking to the patients, doing the risk stratification and the low risk should have health and lifestyle advice, but actually don't really need that much um, else. Um, but it's the high risk patients that need all the resources in to try and um, really optimise anything to be done, ideally with other staff and have a shared decision making discussion. Um, which the St Thomas's um, uh, perioperative um, care and the older person uh, service found reduced uh, people actually wanting their surgery by 15%. Uh, so it's the, it, but it's shared decision making to try and get people as, as good as they can be and to be honest about um, about what, why we're doing what we're doing and what it's going to be like. Um, and shared decision making, we need the patient to come asking the benefits, the risks, alternatives, what happens if I do nothing. We need to prime the patients and be ready, ready for that. Uh, and you will get fewer satisfa higher satisfaction and fewer operations. Um, and, and to talk about the alternatives. So um, it's, it's quite nice uh, from my point of view um, that uh, exercise is, is, is good for preparing for surgery, but it's also good for sometimes feeling you don't need surgery. There's many people um, put on a waiting list for knee replacement that might be able to manage with static uh, bike, um, for example. So that's the versusarthritis.org website. Um, it's about pain management and improving um, things. Um, and you've got to work with your patients about what the options are. And it's actually a finite list. Um, static bike is a, um, a picture there for some swimming. Um, and I've helped swimming on, on health and well being effective swimming um, because you need to actually do something you don't realize how much exercise you're doing when you're swimming because you don't feel sweaty but it might be a something that people can do and particularly with people deconditioned over the pandemic um, I've just bought myself an exercise bike at home um, and because um, I'm not allowed on my bike at the moment um, and uh, and it's it's great you just sit there and you know play on your phone watch telly and you do it but people just need to do a something um, I've mentioned the teachable moment, the fitter, better, sooner. And we do need to get that message out because maybe it's obvious, but it's not obvious to everybody. It just needs to be obvious to everybody, to the managers, the receptionists, um, the healthcare assistants. Every, everybody needs to know that that's OK. That's good. Um, and, and you just need to pick what you do. It's not a question of whether you do it. It's what, what, what you do. And just while we're talking about teams, um, this came out last year, it's only 12 pages, from the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges about how we use teams, and actually we use teams pretty badly. Um, what we need is a transdisciplinary team, because there's a danger with a multidisciplinary team that you're so busy waiting for the very clever physiotherapist to come around and do that assessment or, or something, that you don't think, actually the physio's off at the moment, um, I'm going to teach the patient you how to get out of bed, otherwise no one's going to do it so um and and training up people to be clear about what's allowed um and you know it, the, the patient information leaflet i showed earlier is about um on one bit for the hip fracture that we use in east sussex put a plastic bag on the front seat when you go in a car so get your bottom in, in first and swing your legs around so a healthcare assistant can say look it's in the leaflet you can do this now and that might get the patient home while their daughter is able to collect them in the car rather than waiting for transport I'm just it's just empowering the rest of the team sharing skills identifying who's got unique skills identifying the common basics everyone should have and then the super specialist stuff that you know if everything's going well so and so can see but we need we don't meet regularly enough we don't value team members and we don't we should be looking you should have combined surgical and anesthetic, surgical and anesthetic meetings all the time um well not quite all the time but, um, but but lots of the time um so teams are great um and this is um when i was on the council college of surgeons we produced quite a lot of stuff around we've got one on managing disruptive behaviors in surgery so i'm sorry if any of you need that but it's available on rcs.ac.uk um and it's basically people sometimes don't realize how they are seen. I wrote the one on avoiding unconscious bias um, because sometimes people are so stuck in the moment and so stuck in trying to do their best thing for the patient at that time. They don't realize that they come over as being a bit of a shouty person or a bit of a not listening to other people. So you need there's a lot more work now about human factors and high performing surgical teams. Um, but some, you know, if it's a critical moment, if it's that, like flying below 10,000 feet where you need 100 percent concentration and the radio switched off that's fair enough you get on with it but at other times you need to be a little bit 
looking like you're listening, using the team and planning ahead for those critical, critical moments. Um, and I've talked about uh, team transdisciplinary. So it's not multidisciplinary, it's transdisciplinary where you share the skills. And I've talked about doctor's assistants already. Um, and this is the, the bit from the patient information leaflet, the putting a plastic bag on or carrier bag on the seat helps. Um, and the, you know, I'm on crutches at the moment, good leg up to heaven, bad leg down to hell, other um, ways of looking at religion is available. But, you know, you just, if you know what you have to do, it's very empowering for the patient and it helps um, if the staff can know they're giving clear information, they're not going to get shouted at for doing the wrong information, not that anyone shouts at anyone anymore. So on to day surgery. Day surgery is fab. It's much more efficient. Um, you have the same person checking them in as sending them out with their party pack of painkillers at the end. You've got better staff satisfaction, better patient satisfaction, fewer complications, geographically clean areas. You're not waiting for lifts, porters and beds. And the commonest reason for an operation to be cancelled at the moment is lack of a bed. So anything that could be day surgical should be day surgical. And the rule book's been rewritten. Um, so if you've got diabetes, you are allowed to come to day surgery. If you've got dementia, you are allowed to come to day surgery. And in fact, um, there was one diabetic report said that 9% of um, uh, units didn't allow people with diabetes on to day surgery. Um, but you just you just need clear um, uh, triggers of when you need to intervene. So do read that. It's got um, the list of what is allowed and what's not allowed. Um, and it's, as I say, from the Centre for Perioperative Care, from getting it right first time in British Association of Day Surgery. And it's got examples, it's got example letters in of, of um, writing to the patients and so forth. So do do look at it. And there, But a lot of things need to change. So, for example, you need a couch rather than a bed. You need to get people ready in advance. You need to um, have everything ready. People need to plan ready at home afterwards. And just be aware that it's not just for elective you could get things ready for emergency operations in this way. There are a number of emergency cases that could be done on a planned day case basis. Um, I'm just um, putting up, this is from the um, uh, GERFT report on um, day surgery. So this is um, the top, this is all the trusts going across um, and the top decile of trusts um, admit that the red arrows are who the pay proportion admitted, which is around um, 20, 15% uh, or so, and um, as opposed to being day cases, and then the lowest quartile, um, there's about 30% admitted rather than being day cases. So there's quite a room for improvement and every little bit that makes that better make, improves it. And some of it's optimization, some of it's patient choice, but it's basically normalizing it as being day case and having some senior support in the day case unit um, to permit it and allow it and encourage it and support it um, and having um, party packs of painkillers to go home with and all that kind of thing. It's all in the book. Um, it, it just It's just considering things in a different way. Um, and it's also particularly in the pandemic, you don't really want to share beds with other specialties. Um, if you're trying to get your clean areas, um, and it is far, um, far more efficient. So I think I've covered the better preparation pathways and team working um, already. But you do, you need the environment to change. You need the couches. You need almost a lockable door so um, that area can't be populated with with other people. And I realise the other pressures that everyone's going around in, in the um, in the country. Um, and we mentioned emergency pathways. Um, emergency surgical admissions can be reduced by around 25% with hot clinics. So it's not just better for the patient, it improves the service efficiency. Um, I did uh, an MBA and my um, dissertation was on changing people we knew needed admission with their fracture, with a, but could go home, uh, say with a wrist fracture that was displaced come back to a fracture clinic and then be booked onto a day case operating list um, to have their manipulation and k-wiring or um, plating or whatever it was um, and that that worked um, that worked very well but we don't so it's, it's get big having the hot clinics and the um, association of surgeons of great britain and ireland said um, similar for um, general surgery 
Um, that's a couple of things I've written. I wrote something in the BMJ that I thought would change the world in 2017, saying if we focus on physical activity, we won't need so much social care. Because if people can get out of a chair quickly, so that's sit to stand a lot, they don't need a carer to take them to the toilet. But it didn't change the world. <clears throat> and just saying, one quarter of adults do absolutely no exercise at all. That's less than 30 minutes of exercise that get their heart rate up a bit in a whole week. They just it completely inactive. And lots of things stop people doing things. And this is this is just an orthopedic guide to um, uh, brain um, chemicals. You've got certain things that make you do stuff, but the endorphin takes 20 minutes to work. So you just need to get out. You need to have it in a habit so that that's what you do. So you need the dopamine, you need it in a habit. So you've got your running shoes by the front door, or this is what you always do on Tuesdays. And that's why particularly the cycling to work thing works quite well particularly do it for other people, the serotonin, the do it together, the park run on a Saturday morning, but you need to, you need to fit it in a habit. It's a similar, um, we just need to harness those. And the biggest benefits are for those who do least now. So the arrow is on the um, met hours per week of 150 minutes of moderate exercise. Um, and so you get the biggest reduction, about 20% reduction in risk with going from nothing um, to the something the big biggest reduction in risk and this is another paper from bmj with different things you know it's 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 more effective for um preventing stroke or whatever than than, than for some other things uh, and this is me um so um i was um quite ill with cardiac amyloidosis and myeloma three years ago um, and i was told um and i couldn't walk up a flight of stairs basically and i got back going i was told i couldn't have a stem cell transplant because i wasn't fit enough so I thought I'd prove them wrong, got um, that's a static bike in the Macmillan Centre, then I got a, a electric Brompton, I've got a folding bike, I've got an electric mountain bike, I've got an electric bike with a basket on the front, and I just go that went out every single day to get out, to get fit enough, so I could pass their test, so I could get the stem cell transplant, which I had one year ago, which went amazingly well, and I'm back at work, hooray. Electric cycles are a complete game changer. Um, physical activity levels are the similar. If people have an e-bike, they use it. They suddenly use it to go to the shops or whatever um, and switch from their car and they're happier. And you, there's all sorts of things. If you, so if you can get, get your cycle to work scheme to include electric bikes, you suddenly include people with disabilities, women, um, and that sort of thing. You can cycle up the hills with no problem at all. And with the day surgery, I've mentioned the couch, not the bed, and um, you've got to plan ahead. So this is my last case study of me again, hooray. I had a hip replacement five weeks ago. Now, someone else was having a day surgery hip replacement on the same, I heard him being shown how to use the crutches as I was waiting, because I was next after that on the list. But I, a friend of mine had given me ballet exercises beforehand. So you're standing on one leg, bending, all that stuff. So I was able, um, I wasn't, I could get out, of, I got out of day one, I, the day after the operation, they kept me in. They, they were worried about the heart thing um but i did that pre-operative electric bike i wish i could put the strava things on there and everything i did pre-op steak i had to get my iron up i did pre-op veg i did everything i could but we need to make that normal um because if you can get it right for one person on the list you can try and get it right for everyone else we need to teach people that stuff and show how important it is and no complications thank goodness the health benefits of active travel outweigh the risk 10 to 1 risk of pollution, risk of collisions, um, absolutely outweighed by the benefits to health. Um, this is the movingmedicine.ac.uk website. Just try and go through conditions and perioperative care and you'll find out how to do the one minute conversation with a patient um, and what, what to do to get them started, movingmedicine.ac.uk. Much safer for people with long-term conditions to be physically active than they're not. The benefits far outweigh the risks including for people with heart problems and um, they just need to get started from where they're at and build up um just a couple more slides this is sustainability big buzzword at the moment but reduce reuse recycle if we can reduce the number of complications we have we're reducing um the uh, unnecessary usage of equipment and operations and bed stays and all that kind of thing reduce the number of operations even, even better probably this is what sustainability should be based on reduce reuse recycle Operative care is much better for patients, for the cost and for staff. It reduces that moral injury because you actually know you've done the right thing. You're working together as a team. And we need medics to give permission um, to patients to get up and do stuff and to take some to, to help us in the whole to be partners in and part of the team. So that's the website cpoc.org.uk. Um, 
final plug, please give space to people and time on their bikes if they're wobbling along and put in cycle parking and cycle routes on NHS estates so you get your staff fitter um, and happier. And that's it. Um, reduce complications, do more day surgery. It should be default. There should be some reason why you're admitting. There's only you know, limited number of things should be admitted. Follow us on um, Twitter at CPOP underscore news or at Scarlet Wayne Alley. And um, thank you very much. Thank <music> you.